Good to see you guys. Good to be here tonight. First Thessalonians chapter 4, please. First Thessalonians chapter 4. We'll read our text for tonight and then have prayer and then launch into our discussion. Always appreciate seeing uh, everyone who can make it, uh, particularly on Wednesday night, middle of the week. We're all just, you know, just worn out completely. But especially now that it's getting colder, and you go out and brave the elements. Sometimes uh, you don't encourage anybody else tonight, and you encourage me. So there, it's uh, it's good that, that we're all here. I want to ask Darren if he would to lead us in prayer as we begin our study. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everyone here tonight. We thank you for getting us here safely that we can study your word and look at the Thessalonians and glean from that, glean from Paul's letter, what we can do to be better Christians. Please be with us now as we continue our study. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 1 reads as follows, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter, because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another, for that is indeed what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly, and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. We are um, we are giving emphasis in, in our class to this phrase uh, being a contagious church. Uh, the Thessalonians were a contagious church, and we mean that in the best way possible. Uh, we, we've said before, contagious isn't always a good thing. Here, it's the idea of being on fire. It's the idea of being zealous. It's the idea of, of, of having a zeal for God uh, that catches on, that is influential, uh, that draws in others, that is attractive uh, to, to all sorts of different people, to other Christians. Uh, it, it, is, it has been said that, that, that if you've got a pile of damp sticks, one of the things you do is you get the, the middle, you find the core of that, and you get it dried out and get that nice and hot. Well, as that becomes hotter and hotter and hotter, what happens to the rest of the wood? It begins to dry out, and it itself eventually will become hot and burn. That's the idea. And so, and so that can happen, certainly, we can't talk about a contagious church without talking about contagious people. If, if you don't have contagious people, you don't have a contagious church. So that all kind of goes with this. So we're, we're talking about this, obviously, on the individual level. We're talking about it on the, the church level. But, but, but perhaps at this point, just to kind of look back on what we've, what we've considered so far, we could say that the Thessalonians were contagious, such as we've described it, in any number of ways. For review purposes, what, what are some of the ways that we could say the Thessalonians could be described as contagious? Contagious in what ways? Their faith. 
They're contagious in their faith. A contagious faith. That people saw in them a commitment to God and it inspired them to have that, that commitment. Paul was like that too. Remember in the book of Philippians in chapter 1? Through his imprisonment, what did others receive? The courage to what? To speak the word of the Lord without fear. Yeah. So their faith was contagious. What else would we say about them was contagious? Their love for one another. Their love for one another. Their love for Paul was, was clearly evident. Yeah. Okay, what else? Courage. Great. Let's separate it out. Great courage. Let's talk about their courage. How did they have to show courage? How would they need to show courage in the days ahead? As we think about their circumstances, their beginnings as a congregation, how would they shown courage? Did you say opposition? There was a lot of opposition. We talked about the Jews, particularly in Thessalonica, were especially opposed to the gospel. In fact, they would pursue Paul from city to city. And so after Paul's gone, they're stuck there. They, well, in the sense that, I mean, they live there. Those Jews are, are going to continue to be a thorn in their side. So much affliction, much opposition. So great courage. Is it not the case that when, when you have others around you that are, are strong and willing to take a stand on what's right, doesn't that give you more courage to stand? Sure it does. It does for all of us. So, so in, in that, there's another example of how we need one another. We'll emphasize that, that idea tonight, especially. Okay? In what other ways would we say that the Thessalonians were contagious? I don't know if this is the same as courage, but their drive. I mean, you, you meet some people that they just don't give up. They don't quit. No. And, and, we, and you watch them and it's like, well, they're, they're bound to quit at some point. Well, surely after this, they'll quit. And they just don't. That describes several people in this church. It occurs to me. Yeah, it's like uh, getting a car you think you can be a veteran from bar. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Get, get, that's a great example. Uh, yeah. Jim and Barb just don't quit. Yeah. 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 For sure. Okay? Any other ways in which the Thessalonians were contagious? We, we broad brushed it just a bit here. Okay? Let's, let's put a few things on the screen here. Uh, would it be fair to say they had a love affair with Christ, right? This, this burning desire... Uh, to live for God has there's the heart of it all, and that is they are in love, not just with truth. That love affair with truth, but with the Christ that is at the center of that truth. Um, you, you read throughout the book of Acts, the kind of change that you saw and, and the, the power to bring people together is in him. The two have become one, Ephesians chapter 2. That love affair with Christ uh, leading to radical transformation, we, we noted in chapter 1 uh, that people, th their reputation uh, preceded them. It was reported about them how they had turned to God from idols. We don't know how many years they had, had worshipped idols, how ensconced they were in that kind of lifestyle. And yet the power of the gospel, the power of Christ had turned them away. Uh, to, it says, from idols to serve the living and true God. Uh, and so this kind of goes, this third point kind of goes with that. Once you stake your claim with Christ and decide it is, it is him all the way, well, that's not going to be any secret to Satan. And so he will fiercely oppose. So uh, there are several references to suffering and to affliction 
uh, throughout throughout this um, these two letters. They remain steadfastly, as Darren noted, committed to the truth amid opposition, uh, continuing in prayer. As John noted, they had a contagious faith, a contagious love, someone else said, and hope in the face of affliction. In fact, those three things are some of the first three things that Paul notes about them. Their faith, their hope, and their love. And I know that rolls off the tongue, but there's substance uh, to all of those terms, very rich terms. But all of them are connected with the idea of work or labor. This was a working church. This was a laboring church. This was a church on fire. And we're going to talk about tonight, that, well, and, and indeed in the class last week, uh, their example brought great comfort and encouragement. Remember, the entire occasion for the writing of this letter was what? Paul was concerned about them, and he sent Timothy to see as to their, their welfare, and he brought back good news, and that was a tremendous comfort uh, to him. Uh, they had a genuine love for others, as we've noted, and expressed uh, love. It's not just enough for us to have love for one another. Um, in, in fact, just a quick aside, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Just a, just a quick point about this. I think we would all say about one another is, is that we care for one another, don't we? Now, yes, there are times we let one another down, but, but overall, we very much love one another. If for no other reason than because of our association in Christ Jesus, that's the tie that binds. Uh, but, but there's a, there's a, well, it's like the, it's like the husband and wife where the husband says to the wife, well, I told you on the day that we got married that I love you. And if that ever changes, I'll let you know. How's that going to fly? We need to continually express our love, right? Demonstrate our love. Uh, anybody know the context of second Corinthians two? Just a quick rabbit trail here. We'll go down. What had happened? They had, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Dixie. They had practiced church discipline for to bring a sinner back who was right. engaged in incest and came back uh, as a result of the discipline and repented. And Paul said that don't overload him. That's right. You need to accept him and show your love. That's right. So that he can start over again. That's right. And exactly where I was going with that, there's the statement I thought of in 2 Corinthians 2 and verse 8. It says, so I beg you to reaffirm your love for him. You see, when we don't do that, we open the door to Satan. And Satan will get us telling stories about each other that aren't true. And Satan will encourage us to fill in the blanks about one another. So there's great value to this. That's, that, that could be our entire study tonight. And then, and then uh, finally, the Thessalonians were contagious. It's, it's just as a function of who they were. They obviously were engaged in helping others discover their, their need for Jesus. And so uh, that brings us to chapter 4. And verses one through uh, twelve, uh, we're gonna we're gonna just spend a few minutes here. We're gonna divide this up into into three sections. You have they'll be similar to uh, some of the study questions that you had. Uh, let's just talk about the, uh, the 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 general instructions given. Obviously, we want to go deeper than that. Um, we have we have titled this study. Excel still more. Now, I read from the English Standard, it doesn't use that particular language. It says to do so more and more. Others say excel still more. Anybody have a different rendering? The end of verse one. Excel still more. To do so more and more. What else do you have there in verse one? Does anybody say abound? It does? Okay, okay. 
So it's a bit of a sanity check for me. I was trying, I, I thought maybe one of them did. So, okay, so that, we, we talked about that concept here before. We talk about it a lot. Uh, abound more and more. We spent an entire year talking about that idea, right? The pursuit of, of excellence. Okay, so, so using that just for the sake of discussion as our heading, uh, what specific instructions does Paul give them under that heading? Uh, the question is phrased on the sheet, not the greatest way of saying it. In what ways does Paul urge Christians to abound or excel in their lives? So let's just identify what some of those individual instructions were. What's one? By the way, it's not a comprehensive list. He just talks about a few of them. Danny? Okay, to live holy lives. Unholy lives are not excellent lives. Pursue holiness. And we could get a little bit more specific than that. I mean, that's the idea. Live, live lives reflective of the fact that you serve a holy God. Be holy as I am holy. Does he give any specific applications of that? Okay, very pointedly he says so, doesn't he? Uh, in verse uh, 3, this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality. It's every man's battle. It's every woman's battle, I dare say. It's every generation's battle. And so the instruction here is, is timeless. Uh, we won't, uh, you know, sexual immorality will quell, will quench our zeal for God. And get involved in in that sort of thing, and uh, it will just it destroys individuals' lives. It it does great damage to congregations, and so that's one of the specific instructions. What else does he say in this chapter? Okay, very good. Let's walk through that, okay? The fanatics, the busybodies, and the, and the loafers, okay? Um, okay, so the verse on the, uh, for the fanatics. You have a particular verse you're looking at on that? Looking at um, <coughs> verse 11, that you also aspire to lead a quiet life. Okay, okay. And then busybodies right after that to mind your own business and to work with your own hands. Okay, okay, gotcha. Yeah, he speaks to different, essentially to, to, to maybe different parts of the church there or speak to different needs within the church. That instruction uh, may have hit different people in different ways. To aspire to live quietly. Um, how did yours render that? Does it say aspire to live quietly? To lead a quiet life. To lead a quiet life. Or and that means not striving for attention. Not striving for attention, okay? Um, the New American Standard, I think, uses the, the, the wording, make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. So it goes to more than action. It speaks to one's desire, as you pointed out, a desire for attention versus a desire to just live a life pleasing to God and his attention is good enough. For us uh, to lead a quiet life okay so so we could maybe uh, whether it's the fanatics or the attention seekers um, he says aspire have different aspirations okay to mind your own affairs of course is a statement to the busybodies uh, to those um, who spend a lot of their their time nosing into what everybody else is doing and then uh, something that recurs, a, a problem that recurs in these letters is, is the idea of working with your hands. Um, some of this, I think, has a, has a connection to their misunderstandings about the Lord's uh, return. Uh, it, would, it would appear that some of them, as you read through both letters, just stopped working. So expectant were they that Jesus was going to come any moment. It just... Life came to an end, 
uh, stop working, stop all together, and Paul says no. And so we see, we see an instruction at least pointing that direction uh, here in verse 11, okay? What are some other general instructions that Paul gives uh, in, these, in these 12 verses? Yeah, Luke? Something I noticed was maybe not a particular instruction, but um, okay. maybe maybe the way he gave his the instructions. In verse 1, uh, he says, we ask and urge you. Mm. And that kind of stands out to me because it, it's not that Paul is encouraging them to do this. He is begging them to do mm. this. So um, I, I looked on my little Bible app and found that the, the word that he uses there for that we urge you to do to do this is the same word that's used by the demons in Matthew chapter eight when they're begging Jesus to, to let them out to, to to go into the pigs and for Jesus not to torment them. So they're begging for their life, and in the same way, Paul is begging them to save their own lives by following these instructions. That brings something to the passage for sure. That is, uh, it's not. Uh, Maybe in the demon's case, it was desperation. Desperation may not be the best, best way to characterize this, but a very intense plea, uh, for sure. Great observation. Yeah, I, I didn't see that. We ask and urge. Well, you know, to that point, I really, I'm just going to get for I don't like the wording of this particular title, so you come up with something else. I am concerned, though, with the idea of motivation and kind of to kind of uh, uh, piggyback on what you said, Luke. There, there are the instructions given, but it is noteworthy that the number of different ways he he goes about really now. Are, are, is this a friendly audience? I mean, they're reading it. Is this a friendly audience? Yeah. Most assuredly. So why ask and urge? To Luke's point, why would that even be necessary? I mean, they're already, I mean, their thinking's already, they already know all this stuff. In fact, he comes out and says, uh, just as you are doing, verse 1, uh, verse 9, what would he say? You have no need for anyone to write to you. So it's not like he had to sell them on these instructions. They understood the instructions. Their thinking was aligned with the instructions, so why all the intense pleading, Chris? It just adds emphasis. Okay, for the sake of adding emphasis? And making it very important. Okay, okay. To highlight that it was, it was really important. I, I certainly think the Thessalonians believed it was important, but sure, it, it sure did heighten the, the amount of importance. Darren? Yep. Yep. For sure. Intense opposition, maybe on a daily basis. What do you what do you think they did with this letter when they received it? You think they made a copy of it? There may have been several copies made of it as we consider the evidence uh, of extant manuscripts today. Uh, lots and lots of we don't have any of the originals or the autographs, but we have lots and lots and lots of copies. I don't know how many copies they would have made, but there sure would have been a need to, to emphasize strongly in the text, and then there would be an ongoing need for them. Well, what do they sometimes do with these letters in the assembly? Read them out loud. In fact, in some of Paul's letters, he gives instruction for them to do that. He gives you a little bit of insight about their assemblies and, and what we take for granted, our nice little leather-bound Bibles or whatever format they're in, we just open them up anytime we want, right? They were going to need this. And so, so to aid in writing this on their heart, Paul is really driving the point home. Because Darren, you're right. I mean, any of us think, I mean, we, we, have, we have, there's ebb and flow in our fervor for God, in our service to God. There's sometimes we're riding high and sometimes we're not. Oh, we put on a good face on Sunday morning, don't we? 
Uh, I can do that as well as anybody else, but then, but under the surface, check under the hood, and we're struggling. And and we need encouragement like this. Sometimes we need a fire lit under us. Maybe they didn't need this as much as they would need it later, but he wrote it that way just the same. Uh, because and, and, it, and so it takes on a, a, a timeless quality uh, to it. So what were some of the, the, the ways he sought to motivate them? Uh, verse 1 is, we request, the New American Standard says, we request and exhort. And having heard that explanation, I, I like urge better now in the, in the English Standard Version. How else does he seek to motivate them? Cites his authority. Okay, cites his authority. Uh, verse 2, you know what commandments we gave you by the authority of the Lord Jesus? That, that was meant to carry weight and thus would be part of the motivation to, uh, to do what the Holy Spirit is urging them to do. How else, Bailey? In verse 1, when he talks about, uh, or makes that, Edition where it says just as you actually do walk. Yes, I, that can almost be like a self-fulfilling prophecy Like someone reads that or if someone says like yes. okay, well you fulfill this particular quality That just makes me want to be that that Even much more. more so you're like oh Paul thinks that I walk in a good way So That's I'm gonna like keep trying to do that and improve on that. Absolutely, right. Absolutely, right He's lifting them up And that's something else we can do for one another when we see one another doing something good. We tell each other that we're not by that saying that, that we've mastered whatever that is, but that's important, and it, and it does elevate us. When, when somebody else, that, so there is an implied expectation. It's kind of like when the Hebrew writer says, we expect better things concerning you. Here's, here's these people that are about to just give up and go back to Judaism, and the writer says, we expect better things of you. That, that elevates. That's important language for us to use with each other. I expect you're going to be faithful in your trials because that's what I observe. And that's, that's not placing too much emphasis on the person. Our, our boasting is in the Lord. Yeah, very, very motivating. Uh, verse 2, uh, he says, for you know. So that kind, of, that kind of dovetails with what Bailey just said. He's saying to them, I know you don't really need me to tell you this. That's lifting them up, too. That's, that's urging them to continue to be knowledge. He's commending them for their knowledge. The, implied, the implication is continue to press forward uh, in your knowledge of the will of God. Then he noted the authority of Jesus in verse, uh, verse 2. Um, I thought I saw another place where the... well. Verse 3, for this is the will of God. I would, I would couple that together with the statement about authority. Okay? How else does he motivate? Anything else in verse 3? How about the word sanctification? What's that big old word mean? Sanctification. It's the same word family. So. As saint and as holy or holiness, the idea of being set apart. So when he talks about your sanctification as a Christian, so Paul writes to Mark, he says, remember your <coughs> sanctification. John, remember your sanctification. That's a bit big picture, right? It's, it's kind of calling into remembrance. Remember what you signed up for. Well, that's right. Remember, remember the God that you serve. Remember what he's done for you. Remember what he's called you to be. Remember the price that has been paid for your redemption. Remember the great love that he has shown for you. He has set you apart. You are special to him. All of that would, would be, be part of that idea of sanctification. And, and so there's, there's an, an implication here to the reader. You are special in the eyes of God. Live that way. Don't live like uh, the world. 
Uh, in fact, verse 5. Well, verse 4, he mentions sanctification and what else? With it. Honor. Honor. He's seeking to motivate them by saying, act honorably. That, that, that calls us, that, that motivates us to seek higher things, right? We don't want dishonorable. We want honorable. And when he says this is honorable, that's, he's, he's wanting us to push for that. Yeah. I was just thinking that probably plays into their culture and their, like the honor, shame, kind of the way that mm. the ancient cultures are set up, maybe even more so than... Um, how we and like our modern culture would like how much that would resonate with us like it would probably be even more important to them to be that set apart group that um, especially since they were speaking to the Jews like they've they've always seen themselves as a group set apart they were God's chosen people so mm -hmm. kind of like feeding into that almost maybe mm. With a segment of the church, uh, perhaps. Yeah. And there, were, there was a big mix of Jew there were. Okay. and Gent Gentile. Uh, well, but all the more, they as one are now God's special people. So it's, it's that same, Moses kind of took the same tactic with the Israelites and talked about, uh, I chose you, thus says the Lord, not because you were the greatest or the mightiest, but because of my love for you, I, I did this, and I did this, and I did this. Verse 5, not in lustful passion like the Gentiles. Sometimes today in advertising, you'll hear, you'll hear people say, don't be that guy. Maybe a little bit of that here. Don't be like uh, what you've what you've come to realize is displeasing in the eyes of God. That's, that's, that's the idea there. How about verse 6? How does he motivate in verse 6? Here he's talking about sexual immorality, and what does he say? That no man what? No man take advantage of, transgress, and defraud his brother. So uh, it seems he may have had a specific kind of sexual immorality in mind there. How else does he motivate in verse 6? So he makes it personal, right? Don't hurt your brother. You know, speaking about sexual immorality... Whenever we're tempted to get involved with that, if we will just stop and think about the people we will hurt if we continue on with this course of action, what would what would that be likely to, to help accomplish? If if we're tempted to look at something on the internet that we should, what would help us in, in, in terms of one another to, to click elsewhere? Should affect your conscience. Well, it should affect your conscience, yes. Certainly, absolutely right. But what about each other? Could no what thoughts gonna, about each other? No good's gonna come from it. No good's gonna come from this. You just don't want to disappoint anyone. Would you want to try to explain this to somebody? Explain it to my daughter? Or your daughter? Darren, what'd you say? I just said, I'm thinking how it would affect your spouse. Uh, be, yeah. You could have started with that. How will this hurt the person that I said I would spend the rest of my life uh, uh, walking beside? So, so that one statement there, how else does he motivate in verse 6? What does he say about the Lord? He is the avenger. He is the avenger. So if man never detects this, God will. He will avenge the wronged husband. Uh, there's also in verse 6, just as we told you before and warned you. What about verse 7? This elevates as well. You see the word purpose? God has not called us for the purpose of impurity. So now, 
These aren't just a, a set of iso these aren't just a, a loose collection of isolated instructions. All of them have purpose from God. This is the he is pointing to the broader theme of transformation uh, in Christ Jesus. It's not just about plowing through honoring God's commands about worship or about doing this or not doing this. It's about us becoming something. And, of course, that's, that's a lifelong process. So there's purpose. Uh, we noted verse 11, aspiration, ambition. Verse 8, he who rejects this is not rejecting man but God. So don't be found in a position where you're, you're rejecting God. So, yeah, if it, I happen to take a, a colored pencil and just kind of every little thing, I, okay, he's motivating here and here, and that color is all over this, this text here. Um, verse 10, indeed, you do practice it toward the brethren, to Bailey's point. Uh, then verse 12 was the motivation. Walk or live honestly to them words out, as well as the ones that are in the church. Okay, so two things there, Mansell points out. There's our influence on those that aren't Christians. We need to remember our lives are lived in their presence. But then also, uh, not be in any need. So there's there's the practical matter of, and and when it, whenever possible, if, if we can work with our own hands and supply uh, with God's help everything that we need, that's a great position to be in. It's something for which to be thankful. Um, so we could, have, we could have taken any one of these and just continued uh, talking about it. But, but I think there here is a call to deeper transformation. Um, what about verse 4? What about in verse 4 calls us to more than just an instruction? <coughs> and you can abstain from worldly and fleshly appetites and go to the more holy appetite. Okay, abstain from fleshly appetites and go toward the holy appetites. So transform your appetites. What else is in verse 4 that points to transformation? I have to line the phrase know-how. Sometimes there's no, God gives us the K-N-O-W, knowledge. And then there's some know-how. And he calls upon us to grow in wisdom, to know ourselves, to know our weaknesses, and to be able to apply the will of God to take an instruction and to figure out what that looks like in our lives. That's a, that's a, sexual immorality is something that needs to be preached about. But then at home, verse 4, there's a responsibility for each of us as we're becoming in Christ to know how to possess. What does he say when he says possess his own vessel? What's he talking about? His own vessel. Body. Yeah, disciplining our body, but, but now it's not my body. When he says a vessel, that, that even elevates our view of our own bodies, right? And their appetites. It's a vessel for God. It's an instrument for God's purpose, for God's good pleasure. So there's no how. Verse 7, uh, I, I highlighted the word purpose. That's deeper transformation. Verse 11, make it your ambition. We can plow through commands and not necessarily have it as our ambition to do so. That seems to point toward a deeper transformation of just our, our, our thinking, our heart, in every way. Make it your ambition. We can lead a quiet life, but it may not be our ambition to do so. We do so, well, because the text says so, and look, not to belittle a respect for what God says. But is it really the ambition of our heart to live a quiet life? That could be a separate discussion. You know, Misty described it in terms of being attention-seeking. 
It's a lot in this text, these 12 verses. Okay, well, that was our second belt, so we'll stop. Um, I failed to have the... Uh, the next session is on the bookshelf out here in the foyer. So pick up a copy of session number six uh, before you leave tonight. Let's sing the song, The Lord Has Been Mindful of Me. After we sing this song, we'll be led in prayer. Those songs. 
so. Though wide through the valley of shadow, or mountain, or troubled sea, and oft in the darkness have traveled, the Lord has been mindful of me. The Lord has been mindful of me. He blesses and blesses again. My God is the God of the Much more than my grief and my sorrow, much more than adversity, much more than the all I have given, the Lord has been mindful of me. The Lord has been mindful of me. He blesses and blesses again. My God is the God of the living, how excellent is his name. I'm rich, I am saved, I am happy, I help in prosperity. I friends, I have doors ever open, the Lord has been mindful of me. The Lord has been mindful of me. He blesses and blesses again. My God is the God of the living. How excellent is his name. Let us pray. Father, we come before you this evening, and we thank you again for your goodness to us. You, you are so mindful of us, uh, the small things that we're just wonderfully blessed with, the, the warm clothes we could put on as we came out tonight, the vehicles we have to get around in, the schools, our families, our homes, the medical care. Uh, we, again, are so abundantly blessed by you, and may we use and, and thank you for those things. And give you the glory. Lord, as we've had an opportunity to study tonight uh, from your word, we pray that we will be people that abound more and more spiritually in the love, faith, and courage. And Lord, that you will bless us numerically that cause growth here, to add to your church here, that we do our part in planting, watering, and, and then reaping for you. And we pray also that we'll live all the more in holiness and we'll think about holiness more and not let it be an afterthought or just a, a word we use here in church, but a word that we'll think about and use in our homes. And Lord, we pray too as we engage those around us that it will be our, our mindset to lead quiet lives, to mind our own business, to work diligently so that others will see the good works we do and give you glory. And Lord, we long for your son's return. May we also remember that and have that ever in our mind that you will come again. You will uh, take those home that please you into a place that's far beyond our imagination. We thank you for that hope, something so far greater. And Lord, may it energize us, may we comfort one another, and may we uh, offer that good news to others. Thank you for this time we have this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs> Happiness is the Lord. <laughs> Happiness is to know the Savior living a life within his favor, having a change in my behavior. Happiness is the Lord. Happiness is a new creation, Jesus and me. Was relation having a part in his salvation? Happiness is the Lord. Real joy is mine, no matter if teardrops start. I found the secret, it's Jesus in my heart. Happiness is to be forgiven, living a life that's worth a living. That leads to heaven, happiness is the Lord. Happy 
Happiness is the Lord. Happiness is the Lord. So, like probably many of you, I have training at uh, my job that I that I go to and on an occasion, pardon me, occasion I, I run into something that is interesting, a lot of times it's boring, um, sometimes it's funny. Uh, one, of the, one of the trainings that I've, I've been to recently, I've, I've actually seen this example um, several times um, before, but it was just a refresher, was a, a way to identify uh, characteristics in people and understand who you're dealing with and, and what uh, what are the best ways to communicate with them? And that's, that is uh, one of the ways that they give you is um, to look at people as if they're birds. And so I don't know if you've seen that or not, but there are eagles, there are peacocks, there are doves, and there are owls. So you probably um, make a determination without knowing anything other than that, which bird you are. It's pretty easy. Um, to, to put people into those categories. So eagles are, are dominant, decisive, peacocks are interactive and charming, doves are supportive and understanding, owls are analytical and objective. So if, if you're on a sales call and it goes bad, it's typically because you've misidentified what type of bird they are. So if you walk in and you think you're talking to a, be a peacock, and they're actually a dove, it, it's, it's really not going to work because it, it just doesn't flow. So um, it, it, it's interesting that there's a, they actually have um, a picture, I guess it goes along with this, if that helps you kind of understand. I think those pictures all pretty accurately um, identify characteristics of those birds and, and therefore the people as well. So tonight, um, I, I want to just talk about somebody in the Bible who makes a misidentification. So if you would be turning your Bibles to John chapter 4. It's a story we know well. Jesus finds himself in Samaria. And we're told he's at a place, uh, a well that's called Jacob's Well. We'll start reading in verse 7. John chapter 4, starting in verse 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews don't associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. All right, so again, a story that's probably familiar to most of us. It's not, it's been a while since you've read it. I give you permission to skim through the rest of the story. It's very interesting. Uh, we won't, won't really go much further than that. But Jesus said, um, uh, being the, the master communicator that, that he is, and obviously having the understanding that, that he had, he, he quickly brings it to her attention that, he, that she has incorrectly identified who he is. She, she's... She's, she's, she's all wrong on who she's talking to. Jesus says, you're, you're not understanding something. Every time you come to this well, you're just going to need to come back to the well again. That's just the nature of, of what you're doing. Uh, all the things that you pursue in this life, just like the water from this well, all the things you pursue in this life are going to leave you empty. But I have something that's truly going to satisfy you. I have something that's going to swell up in you like a living, a living water that's going to swell up in you uh, and, and lead to eternal life. That, that is what I have to offer. I'm not offering, offering a, a normal water, something that will leave you craving it again. I'm going to give you something that will satisfy forever. So just like us, this woman uh, was, I think she was searching for something. Uh, and, and whatever it is, uh, whether she was searching for meaning, for peace, for security, for happiness, uh, she, she was searching for something. Something, and apparently she was she was finding that in her relationships with 
her husband. Jesus says, go get your husband. He, she says, I don't have one. He says, you're correct. You have, you've had five. So whatever she was looking for, she was finding it in those relationships as opposed to putting her trust in Jesus. So here's the application that I think that, that we have for us tonight. What is it that's keeping us from fully trusting in Jesus? What, what, maybe it's just one thing. Maybe, maybe it's a multitude of things. But you know, what is it? Is it? I mean, could it be money? Could it be relationships? Could it be family? What is it that's keeping us from fully trusting in Jesus? Every well that we dig on our own is, is just going to come up empty. All, if we, we could dig all the wells in the world, and it's just going to lead to more searching. You dig another well, and it's going to come up empty, and you're going to keep on searching. Then you're going to go dig another well, and it's going to be empty, and you're going to go through life that way. Every well that we dig on our own will lead to emptiness. So this woman had made a mistake in who Jesus was. She thought she was standing by a well talking to a man. When in reality, she was, talk she was standing by a hole in the ground talking to a well. So do we really understand the need that we have, the desperate need that we have for Jesus? If we're going to find happiness, true happiness, it's only going to happen when we dig a well and Jesus is at the end of it. And we do that with Jesus. This, the Samaritan woman eventually came to that understanding uh, in her life that she desperately needed Jesus. Do we understand that? That is, I think, is the application uh, for us tonight. If you do have an understanding that you need Jesus desperately, and that's something that you need to make known uh, before the congregation tonight, we invite you to come as we stand and sing. Jesus, draw me ever nearer as I
Just a couple of announcements tonight. Uh, please remember those that are listed in the encourager that need our prayers. I just had a couple of updates tonight. Uh, Jim Morris uh, seems to be getting better. Uh, he went to the doctor today, uh, and uh, of course they ran more tests, so he's really tired, but uh, they were pleased with the progress it seems to be making after the chemo treatments that he's had. But he indicated to us that he'll be having more chemo a little later on, so uh, let's remember him in our prayers. Uh, then uh, Ray, I believe it was Sunday night, uh, was taken to the emergency room. Uh, they ran tests and he had a major blockage and so they put a stent in. And so he is uh, recuperating, rehabbing out at Addington Place where Eunice is. So he will be there for a while until he can get his strength back. It just uh, knocked him down. Anytime you mess with your heart, um, it's my understanding that is going to happen. So let's remember both of them. Uh, Misty has asked for prayers for her cousin. Uh, I'm going to say David Cruz. What? Chris. Chris. Uh, he is having struggles in his marriage. So uh, she would ask that you pray for him that things might work out. Uh, that is all the updates I had, uh, Chris. Closing prayer. <coughs> Father, thank you so much uh, for this day that you've blessed us with. Thank you for this uh, opportunity we've had to uh, come together in your name. What a, what a blessing it is, Father, to be able to come together as, as your family. Uh, what a blessing it is to be able to be in a relationship with you. We are so thankful for uh, your grace and for your mercy that, that's made it all possible. Uh, we're so thankful for uh, Jesus and uh, all that he has made available to us. Uh, we, we pray, Father, that uh, we, like him, might submit ourselves, submit our own will uh, to yours in all things. We pray, Father, that uh, you would help us to uh, see through uh, all the, the distractions and all the, the temporal things around us. Help us to see you and eternity in, in everything uh, around us and we pray that others might see you through us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.